Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I have the pleasure today of talking to you about something that is probably one of the most common uh, concepts uh, discussed in biology. Uh, it's therefore probably considered to be one of the more important ones, and that is osmosis. And you know, osmosis, you're like, wait a minute, I think I already know this. What could possibly be said? Uh, maybe some of it is review, but I just want to sort of tighten it up, clarify it, give it some examples, and sort of apply it to plants in particular. You know, our, our modern approach to uh, the movement of water is, the old days we used to say that osmosis was the movement of water from an area of high concentration to low, but that's somewhat ambiguous. It leaves people sort of questioning. So our new ver version of this is that water moves from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential. And so that's what I want to talk to you today about more more in particular is water potential and so let's just jump right into that conversation and so one of the things that I want to say about is the difference in water potential is what drives the movement of uh, water in a plant and so right out of the gate we could say that water is going to move from an area of high water potential and we use the the Greek symbol psi for that it's going to move from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential. And so this is what we mean by the difference between these two is what drives the movement of the water. And so you're like, well, what could possibly lower the water potential? Well, as you can see here in this diagram, do you see how this is a semi-permeable membrane? Let me actually um, come back to this diagram when I on the next slide. What I wanted to say first about this is that you know what we're talking about is water the movement of water, and that's osmosis. It's the passive movement of water across the cell membrane. Now, water, do you see it here in this diagram? Water, though it's polar, is small, and it can simply diffuse across the phospholipid bilayer. But, uh, and you're like, well, which direction will it go? Well, again, just like diffusion, water goes, there's no, water doesn't now, water just moves left, right, left, right, into the cell, out of the cell, into the cell, out of the cell, and you're like, nah, I think it goes more in one direction than the other. Well, it, it can, and the two factors that influence water potential or the movement of water is solute concentration. In other words, the dissolved solutes in, in the water on one side of the cell versus the other side of the cell. That could be glucose, it could be sucrose, it could be sodium, it could be any solute concentration. So solute, increasing solute, lowers the water potential. And then there's also pressure. Pressure can be positive pressure or negative pressure. So if you're applying a positive pressure, you can push water. But if you're applying a negative pressure, in other words, like you're, you're pulling something like a vacuum, then that will be a negative pressure and that will draw water into an area. So collectively, Solute concentration and physical pressure is what we're talking about today. And that makes up your water potential, which is, again, abbreviated by the Greek's letter uh, psi. And so here's our picture here. Now, here's our cell membrane. There's our water. So it looks like Mickey Mouse. Now, check this out. If we Do you see here these green balls are solute? Well, let me make a bunch of them over here. So if an area has got a lot of solute, so we, we call that relatively hypertonic, and this must be therefore low in solute or hypotonic. If they were the same, it would be isotonic. So what, what gives? Well, water, let's just focus on water. I'll make water blue. Water is going to move this way, and it's going to move this way. But it's like, well, where is it going to move more? So solute influences it. Check this out. Since the solute, if the solute happens to be hydrophilic in a, or it has some sort of attraction, like it, if it's a cation or an anion, since water is polar, it gets attracted to the sugar, or the, the hydroxyl groups, it gets attracted. And so it tends to cling a little bit. So it's less likely to travel over to another area. This water is sort of free and it's more likely to travel over in this direction. And so water moves from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential. And what's lowering the water potential? What's lowering the water potential is the solute. 
In other words, it has less potential to go over to that direction. So water is moving from side A to side B. Water, again, maybe nothing new. Water goes from hypotonic to hypertonic. You already knew it. Okay. Well, it's important. Water moves across the cell membrane from high water potential to low water potential. And you're like, okay, so it's either going to go one way or the other. And as a result of doing that, you know, the cell can perform work. So uh, the movement of water can cause a cell to swell or it can, or it can be um, that movement of water will allow, and that's why it's called potential. It refers to the sort of the, like potential energy. The, the, the fact that when water moves, it can cause cells to do something. Like, for example, when water goes into guard cells, they swell open. It puts a physical uh, pressure on the, on the cell wall, which then pulls on these uh, cellulose fibers, which causes the cell to, to bow and therefore open and then allow gases to come in. So this is what we're talking about. The uh, water movement has, is, is very important. So... Plant biologists measure uh, psi in in a physical number, so the psi, this pressure, is is measured in units of megapascals. Now, megapascals is uh, capital M P A, and so let's just talk about this briefly. So, one megapascal is equal to ten atmospheres at of pressure, right? and you're like, okay, so one atmosphere of pressure at one atmosphere. In other words, at sea level, is 760 millimeters of mercury. So there's a, a little conversion right there. And so say we had a beaker and a glass tube, and, and this is some kind of artificial cell, and we put some kind of suc sucrose in there. So we have, let's go here, we have some kind of solute. And you're like, oh, yeah, how much solute? Oh, we have a, a 0.1 molar sucrose solution. And so inside the cell, it's hypertonic. So out here, this looks like pure distilled water. And so this distilled water is going to move in right here because it has a higher water potential. And as a result, the water will then thus move up the slide, or the glass tube, I meant to say. And so this can be measured, for example. And this is, where we're, this is what we're talking about. And so uh, for, for purposes of comparison, Water potential of pure water in an open container is going to be, the atmosphere of zero is going to be zero. So what happens is if, okay, so if distilled water, which has no solute, is in an open container in a beaker at, at atmosphere zero, it's going to be considered to have a water potential of zero. So the addition, so if you add salt to that, or if you add sugar to that, it's going to then lower the potential. It's going to have a negative value because it's going to create a hypertonic environment. And, and why is that? Because the water, as we talked about before, sort of uh, forms little shells around the solute, clings to it. It's like a party. So it doesn't want to leave the house. And so, uh, for example, if you put a, a, a 0.1 molar solution of something, uh, any solute, really, it'll lower the water potential, and so what the unit would be sort of negative, so you're lowering it below zero, and so this would be uh, negative 0.23 megapascals. Like, okay. So inversely, though, um, pressure has the opposite effect on it. Like, for example, if you, if you press on a plunger or, or a syringe filled with water, you can push water. And so that applies a positive water potential, so that's a plus. Inversely, though, if you were to uh, suck something up, like in a syringe again, something like that, that would create a negative pressure, so water would come to that area. That would lower the water potential. That would be a negative. So pressure can be positive and negative. And so when you couple those two together, this is important, when you couple these together, water potential is really the both. It's both pressure and solute. Now solute, I'd like to just say solute, but it's solute potential. Sometimes it's called osmotic potential. Sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't do it. And so water potential is a combination of the pressure and the solute. And so let's give some examples of that so, so it makes sense. So if you have a, a one molar solution I mentioned before, it's, it lowers the water potential. So water is going to move from pure water into that 
area. So in other words, let me just draw that briefly. Okay, here's a cell. Here's inside the cell is a, is a 0.1 molar solution. Uh, so it has a negative 0.23 megapascals, and you're like, oh yeah. And then over here, it's in a glass of pure water, which is the water potential is zero. And so where's water going to go? Water's going to go from high, which is zero, to low, which is negative. <laughs> so water will thus go. And again, you're like, why, why is it doing that? Because there's solute in here. Right there, there's solute. It's hypertonic. Over here is hypo. And so water will simply, osmosis, go into the cell. Now, if it's an animal cell, it might swell and, and break. The membrane might rupture and, and cytolysis. But probably in a plant, that's not going to occur because it has that cell wall on the outside, which is going to resist, uh, resist that. And so you're like, OK, so you're just talking about solute. What about pressure? Well, pressure can, can sort of balance this uh, one way or the other. Let's take a look over here. Like if you had this imaginary YouTube, it's kind of funny, YouTube, where you're actually watching this on YouTube. <laughs> so if you had a, a YouTube here and you were able to separate that YouTube with a semi-permeable membrane that would not allow solute, but would allow the movement of water and say you put a lot of solute. No, oh, look, I've lowered the water potential. It's negative. So water is going to go in. Nice. And it's it's negative 23. That's where the water went in. It went zero to negative 23. See that? Water goes from high to low. But what happens if somebody's standing there like this? This is you, and you're standing there pushing down on that plunger. You're like, oh, oh I'm pushing down, pushing down, and I'm going to push down with a positive. Oh, look at this, a pressure of exactly 0.23. So if you do that, oh, the water doesn't go because it's zero and zero. So water does zippity back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, but there's no net movement. And then likewise over here, you can really push very hard. Okay, so this is you and your friend. And so both of you are like really pushing down on it, ah, like this. And so therefore, it's 0.3. So if it's 0.3, that's going to add up to a positive over here, and this is na this is zero. So then the water, and again, this is obvious. So you can overcome osmotic potential by exerting a lot of positive pressure potential. Likewise, negative pressure. In other words, the sucking up like this can cause water to move over into, into that direction. So the negative pressure, positive pressure. So though I'm kind of messing around with it, it's rather critical because it's, it's the movement of water is, is uh, can't think of anything more important. And so what's interesting is when, when, when a cell is flaccid, um, it's not very firm. And, the, and if a cell is placed in a in a high concentration of water then water will go in but if it's put in a concentration that's very sugary like for example look at this plant cell it's being put in a 0.4 molar sucrose solution and it's not going to like that so the water is going to leave and as a result of water leaving it goes from high water potential to low water potential and therefore the cell membrane is actually peeling away from the cell wall, and it's going to lose pressure. You're like, well, what's the consequences of that? We call that plasmolysis. Let's take a take a look at at that because it's, it's such an, a a critical topic. Check this out. You know, here's here's some plant cells. Here's the cell wall. These are the chloroplasts. Check this out. So this is time lapse. So it's happening really fast. You're like, whoa, wait, what's happening? I'm starting to see the cell membrane. You see the cell membrane right there? Before it wasn't visible. And why is that? Water must be leaving. So in other words, these plant cells are being placed in a low water potential solution. So the water is leaving. It's higher inside than outside. So the water is leaving through osmosis. It's losing its pressure. The chloroplasts are all being sort of tied up by the cell membrane and it's forming sort of these green little circles and ultimately the plant would wilt as a result of that. If the plant is wilting it can no longer 
hold itself up, it doesn't get enough sunlight, et cetera, et cetera. It's Troubleville. Okay? So we come back here. And so do you see it? This is the result of plasmolysis as well. That's why there's, they're green, because all the chloroplasts sort of move to the center here. And this is the real cell membrane that you can see it. So this is not, cells don't like that. And so what cells really like is they like it when uh, they're in a solution that is, uh, has a higher water potential than inside the cell, because then water will move in. Water will move in, water will move in. And what that does is it creates a pressure. The cell wall then pushes back on it, and it causes the cell to be rather rigid and firm. And so upright, or crispy carrots, for example. And that uh, turgidity, if you will, uh, helps the plants survive. And so plants prefer that. And so here's a, here's a video right here of plant cells that are in uh, distilled water. And so, you know, how can we tell? Because nothing's happening to the cell membrane. And what you actually see is the chloroplasts are moving around, cytoplasmic streaming. So it's helpful to have a lot of water in, not only to maintain the shape of the plant, but it also helps the chloroplasts move along these little microfibers that are found in, in the plant as well. So that, that's kind of cool. Look at that. I, I really like this video. It's kind of pretty neat right there. So those are cells under experiencing um, turgor pressure. Let's go back up here. And so that's a preferred state when the cell is swollen like that. And so as you can see here, uh, here's a plant that's loving life. This is a plant that's, a, that's hating life and, and it's, it's losing water as a result of plasmolysis. So healthy plants are, are, are turgid most of the time and that contributes to support. You know, again, if you're an herb and you're, and you're not a woody plant, you need that water to provide that, that uh, su support to hold yourself up like that. And so what's fascinating is that recently, scientists sort of uh, determined the fact that water can move so quickly across the cell membrane that there must be something aiding the movement of water other than, the, other than osmosis. There must be something embedded in the cell membrane like, for example, like for other ions, there's, whoops, there's proteins, oops, sorry, there's proteins that are found in the cell membrane that will help um, solutes to move across rapidly, and therefore cells can regulate. You know, if there's no protein, how can you regulate movement? You can't. The molecules just simply move across. The proteins in the membrane help you to be able to regulate. So in other words, more proteins, like this, more quickly uh, transportation can occur. So what's interesting is when scientists were measuring, I believe it was done uh, in the kidney. They were able to determine in an animal, they were able to, to determine that the movement of water, the uptake of water back into the blood from the renal tubules in the nephron was so rapid that it, it couldn't be dis osmosis. It, there had to be some kind of transport that will allow water to move. And so these were called, these were called, I'm not sure <laughs> how we're going to erase this. Uh, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to do that. There's always going to be something, some kind of glitch like that. That's funny though. I'm not sure how I can get out of it. <laughs> Let's go this way. When in doubt, oh no. Let me see if I can go this way. No, it's not allowing me to do any of this. Okay, when in doubt, there we are. That, that's something. <laughs> We're making progress. Sorry about this. And so let's go and escape. Escape usually works for everything, right? Let's do quit. There we go. No, that's not good. Quit. Okay, now it's barking at me. Okay. Let's see if we can go like this. That's something. Okay, maybe. Let's see. Yay, look at that. Perseverance. Uh oh. Perseverance. And so let's go <laughs> let's go back here. So what scientists discovered, uh, 
Uh, not out of the woods. Not out of the woods. Okay. It's not allowing this. Let's just go here. Let's go. Whoops. And let's just go like this. So, what's, I'm sorry about that. What scientists discovered is that embedded in the cell membrane, there's actually protein transports that will allow water to go through, and they're called aquaporons. Kind of a cool name, aquaporons. So pores for water, and those affect they the 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 speed or the rate at which molecules move, but they don't affect water potential. So it's not going to determine direction, but it's just going to increase or decrease rate if they're present. It will increase the rate. If they're not present, then the rate will just be simple uh, diffusion of water, which is osmosis. So what's the point? The point is that cells can regulate the, the uptake or loss of water more efficiently if there's proteins involved. I think that's kind of neat. And so um, one of the final discussions that I'm afraid to even click over there, one of the final discussions that I want to have with you is that um, when water moves from plant to plant like do you know how there's little pores between cells called plasma desmata water could simply move um, across from one cell to another like that or another possibility is water can move through the cell wall I, I know you may not have thought of that before but water the cell wall is sort of like sort of like cheesecloth of its strands of cellulose. Water can sort of zip through cell walls right there. And then cells can also move across cell membranes right in here. And it can also move into the, the cell membrane of the, of the vacuole, which is called the ton tonoplast. And so if it doesn't cross, if water doesn't cross a cell membrane, then there's really no, no way to regulate it. And so... Um, that's that's an issue. Like I just want to mention this tonoplast, which is shown here in green. One of the things about the tonoplast is that it has these proton pumps in it, so it can even help the whole cell out by pushing protons inside the vacuole, and therefore the cytosol is a little bit negative, and which increases the uptake of cations from the outside. That's kind of neat. And so, in in plants, there's really uh, two ways of getting through the plant. You can just simply cruise through the uh, plasma desmata and what's called symplast and apoplast. Apoplast is a way in which the, the plant is able to allow movement of water outside right here through the cell walls. And so the reason that this comes up is that both those two ways are which um, water is able to move in through tissue. Like remember I mentioned that we were talking about cell to cell just a moment ago. Tissue is like when, for example, if in the root, when it's taken in, it moves through the cortex. And so the water cruises through the cell walls or it cruises through the plasma desmata when, it, when it's moving laterally. And so this is what I mean by lateral transport right there. So cell to cell is osmosis. This is lateral. It can move through plasma desmata or it can move through the cell walls. And you're like, wow, I see how, it, how it's happening. But what's fascinating about it, or about this whole conversation is, if there's anything, is that there's sort of a, a centurion. In other words, there's a guard made up by the endodermis, which is the, the layer of cells that surround the steel. And this, what, what this is a, a dicot root. And you're looking at this. And that is important to prevent uh, materials from passing through. If you recall that, that's called the Casparian strip. And then the third type of movement is this sort of bulk flow, where not only is there movement uh, osmosis, and then there's lateral movement, but once it gets into the vascular tissue, then you're going to uh, zip and shoot up the plant very fast. And so that is uh, caused by transpiration. So transpiration is able to move that. And so, you know, when you go cell to cell, it's, it's, it's kind of a slow process, but bulk transport, long distance, can move very quickly. And so what I wanted to say about that, I mentioned this in a previous video, is that the phloem uh, is kind of cool because it, it moves sugar sap by pressure, and that 
pressure is created by a lot of sol solute or sugar in the cell and then water moves in there and pushes it down. Whereas xylem is moved by negative pressure. In other words, when water evaporates from the leaf, it pulls water up. So see the difference? It's pressure pushing down and then this is negative pressure sucking up. And then transpiration is the reason for the negative pressure is all the water is connected through cohesion. And then ultimately, um, this is happening inside the, the xylem, and really the diameter, this is a cool physical thing, the diameter of the cells incre increases the rate or decreases the rate. And the cells are hollow uh, when they're mature, which then allows for more movement entirely. And so let's conclude by taking a look at this uh, video right here, and I'm going to actually let this play. I usually don't let the sound go, but I, I'm going to because I kind of like this right here. The surface area of a root is enormously expanded by thousands of root hairs and symbiotic mycorrhizae. In a later conversation, we'll talk about the mycorrhizae, which are fungi living in symbiosis with most plants, and they're, they're sort of like these stringy uh, tentacles called hyphae, which help to further increase the surface area. Most plants wouldn't survive without these fungal mycorrhizae. The root hairs are in direct contact with water and dissolved inorganic ions held in tiny spaces between soil particles. Water and ions can travel into the root by the apoplastic route, moving between cells and along cell walls, or by the symplastic route, moving from cell to cell through plasmodesmata. A molecule or ion may also move through the root via a combination of these two routes, or by moving slowly from cell to cell across plasma membranes and cell walls. So, Surface area of a... So that's kind of cool. So do you, if you understood that, the, wall, the mo water molecules and dissolved solutes like sodium or potassium, whatever, anything like that can sort of cruise through laterally but it's not going to be able to get into the elevator system over here, which is the steel, because you notice how the endoderm, which is this cell layer right here, has this waxy coat around it called the Casparian strip. So if, if something unwanted, some toxic solute was trying to sneak its way into the, into the tree, it's going to be like bang, bang, bang against this Casparian strip, and then it's going to force it to go through the cell membrane. And if the cell membrane doesn't have a particular proton for that, uh, so, uh, protein for that, it's not going to get in. So the Casparian strip is really selectively permeable uh, and, and helps out on that. And then finally, there's this. Both pathways lead to the cells of the endodermis, which are surrounded by a waterproof seal. This waterproof layer forces water to flow through the endodermal cell. And, and as a result of that, the cell is able to uh, control, uh, like a centurion, what comes in and what does not come in. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation on water potential in plants. Thanks for watching.